want to ask you a couple of questions. Try to locate yourself how you feel when I ask you these questions. Have any of you ever driven your vehicle and then you looked up in the mirror and you noticed that there was a police car right on your tail? Maybe a little too close. Did that affect your driving? Did you drive differently after seeing him right on your tail? Okay, now keep that in mind. What about if you got a surprise visit from the town assessor who was known to be really hard, strict, and letter of the law? And uh, you thought you were going to just slide under the radar. You put an addition on your house, no building permit, and now you get a surprise visit from the town assessor. How would you feel about that? Think about that. So what about, uh, how about if you got a letter from the IRS stating that your tax return was going to be audited? Knowing that ahead of time, would you have been more responsible to prepare your tax return? Maybe you had a really good paper trail, uh, you know, a lot of foundation, a lot of documents. Okay, here's, here's the most pressing one. What if Pastor Pam and Jay were your neighbors? And their den, big window, they could see out and see your TV. And they're not trying to snoop, but they could just look out the window and see your TV. Would you watch? Knowing that you're being watched, would you have less freedom to watch what you're watching? Knowing that you're more accountable? Just a couple of things to... Uh, to tweak your, your, your feelings here, the average human being is likely to act more responsible when we know we're being observed, evaluated, and that we've got to give an answer to someone in authority if we were questioned by them. And the single biggest factor in all of those four examples that I gave you is accountability. We've got to live in such a way that we're accountable. Now, oftentimes we live in, in a way like this because we're accountable to men. We're accountable to our employer. We're accountable to, I'm accountable to my wife and she's accountable to me. I say to her all the time, Lynn, here, take my phone, check it out. Look anywhere you want to look. Here's how you can access it. Here's the history. Here's whatever you want to do. I want to be accountable. Pastor Charlie Sweet and I have been friends for over 25 years. We're accountability partners. I'm accountable to him. He's accountable to me. We, we, we check one another. Pastor Matt, I'm accountable to him who we installed as our senior pastor. I'm accountable to him, and he's accountable to me. There's safety in being accountable. So... If that policeman or that town assessor or that IRS agent or Pastor Pam and Jay uh, make us nervous, how can we change that? Proverbs 10, verse 9, the contemporary English version says, you will be safe if you always do right, but you'll get caught if you're dishonest. Now, I want to just lay a foundation here. Basically, we want to live in such a fashion that we're accountable. Keep that thought in mind. And I want to speak to you this morning a message entitled, Make Your Life Count. Make your life count. Now, you and I have the power to make our life count. That being said, those illustrations that I give you uh, remind me of something that's very foundational, but oftentimes it's overlooked by us. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, talks about the judgment seat of Christ. Are you familiar with that? The judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us must stand before the judgment seat to give an account on how responsibly we lived for Christ. How serious were we? And how much of an effort did we make to obey God's word and commands daily? Now, Christ will decide how responsible we were to complete the plan, and the purpose that he had for our life. All of us have been given spiritual gifts. Did we use these spiritual gifts in the employment uh, of the good works that God assigned for us? These are all things that we have to 
to, to answer for, are we keenly aware that we are going to have to give an account? Now, this, that's good news. See, I like that. I like that because the Apostle Paul likened our life as to a race that we run. Each one of us is in a race not to compete against one another. We're in a personal marathon, each one of us. And like Paul, we've got to run that race with the end in mind. I don't want to train, uh, you know, months to run a marathon only to drop out uh, five-tenths of a mile before the end. I want to finish the race that I started. And if you will keep the end in mind, you'll live for Christ differently, I guarantee you. You will live for Christ differently. In fact, uh, for the purpose of this morning's message, I want you to be sure of two things. Number one, we're all going to die. We can be sure of that unless we get raptured. I hope we get raptured. I pray we get raptured. I want to be raptured. I want to be raptured right now before I finish this message. Because I've got to give an account to Pastor Jay if I go too long. (laughs) So you can be sure that you're going to die. And that's a good thing. And number two, you can be sure that you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I think that this judgment seat of Christ is, is, is misunderstood by many of us. And I hope to bring some clarity on that and let you know uh, from Scripture, really, what this judgment seat of Christ is. It's an elementary principle that's taught in the Bible. In Hebrews, even the writer of Hebrews said, we don't have to go over these basic doctrines of baptism and and, and salvation and judgment. It was the judgments of God were considered basic and foundational back in the church age when it got started. Hebrews 9, 27 says, just as people are destined to die once, no reincarnation. It's appointed unto man to die once. And then the judgment. Now, there are a couple of judgments mentioned in the Bible. But the judgment that we're talking about this morning um, is the, the judgment seat of Christ, sometimes known as the Bema seat. Has Pastor Jay taught on that? Okay, so I'm I'm sure I'm not going to add anything to it, but I'm going to be funnier. So anyway, (laughs) Pastor Jay. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 out of the Amplified Bible says this. Therefore, whether we are at home on earth or away from home and with him, it is our constant ambition to be pleasing to him. That's very important. Your aim and my aim in life is to be constantly Pleasing to God every single day. You know, without a vision, people uh, perish. If you make that your vision every single day, when you wake up in the morning and you pray, God, help me with whatever I look at today, whatever I speak today, whatever my hand finds to do today, that everything I do will be pleasing to you. Start out your day that way. Remind yourself of that during lunch. Remind yourself of that as you're driving home from work and you're going to meet your wife and you're going to meet your children. God, whatever I do or say or however I treat them, let it be pleasing to you, O God. For we, verse 10, believers will be called to account and we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be repaid. For what he has done in the body, whether good or bad, that is, each will be held responsible for his actions, purposes, goals, motives, the use or misuse of his time and opportunities. Now, there are four scriptures. I got to go quickly. I got to speak like Pastor Jay. Let's God. I got to go quickly here. There's four scriptures that we're going to look at. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 10, Romans 14, 10. 
So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. Are you squirming yet? I, I don't want you to squirm because there's a misunderstanding here. So I'm going, to, I'm going to clarify that to you. So if you're squirming, that's good, because you shouldn't be. You should and you shouldn't, and I'll tell you why. Romans 2.6, contemporary English version. God will reward each of us for what we've done. He will give us eternal life to everyone who has patiently done what is good in the hope of receiving glory and honor and life that lasts forever. 1 Corinthians 4, 5, so don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns, for he will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. You see, how we live accounts for rewards given or rewards lost. So every single day you want to make your life count. Make your life count. Listen, God is so incredible, it's mind-blowing. There are many of us that struggle with God's love for us. We seem to think that God's, the shoe's going to fall, the hammer's going to drop, God's just getting ready to drop kick us right through the field goal, and whatever we do, we just can't please Him. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. God is gracious. He's merciful. He abounds in, in mercy and grace and loving kindness. He's for us. He's not against us. In addition to salvation, he gives us rewards. He gives us grace to do what he's called us to do, and then he rewards us for doing it. That's mind-blowing. You know, eternity is a long time, church. It's a long time. In Psalm 39, verse 4, NIV says, Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. Psalm 39, 12 says, Teach us to number our days that we might gain a heart of wisdom. It's important for all of us to, to keep the end in mind. If you keep the end in mind, you'll live presently different than ever because what you do and how you live makes a big difference. Now, in, in May, it, it's just mind-blowing to me. In May, I turned 70. And it's like, how did I get here? How did I get here? This, is, this blows my mind. I still think like I'm, I'm 18. I, I act like, I act juvenile. My wife's always telling me that. But um, um, I'm going to be 70. Now, if God gives me long life, long life is, is you know, 80, 85, 90. Let's just say 90. I don't care to live 120. Some people say, well, I want to live to be 120. I want to be with Jesus. But I'm here. So let's just say I get 20 more years. Teach me to number my days. Okay, God, if you're going to give me 20 more years, how do I want to spend the next 20 years? How do I want to spend the next 20 years? Well, I'll tell you how I want to spend the next 20 years, and it's not because I, I, I'm a, I, I've been a pastor for, for almost 48 years. I'll tell you why, how I want to spend the next, 40, uh, the next 20 years. I want to spend every single day making my life count because God is real, heaven is real, eternity is real, and rewards are real. And as if heaven isn't enough of a reward, we get rewards. So it... If I'm going to live for eternity, I want to live for Christ daily that when I get called up and I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, I want to hear, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. When we read in 2 Corinthians 5.10 that uh, we're going to have to give an account for what has been done in the body, whether good or bad, that wording would be better rendered in this fashion. We're going to have to give an account for our good works. Were they profitable? 
or unprofitable. What I did, did it earn a reward or did I lose a reward? Remember, we read that, that God is going to bring our darkest secrets to light and he's going to reveal our private motives. There's motives why people do things. Jesus talked about it. He said, look, when you do a good deed, don't do it like the Pharisees so that what you do is seen by men. Or if you're going to go, you know, put your offering in. Oh, look at this. I'm giving a hundred dollars into the offering. He said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So the thing to keep in mind and always to check yourself is, why am I doing what I'm doing? And are my motives right? And I don't want you to get into this analysis paralysis, but after a while, you begin to know, you know, am I, am I doing this to be seen of men or am I doing this for God? And I don't care uh, what men think. I'm doing this because to the best of my ability, I'm trying to obey God. You see, God is anyone. There may be a judge in here. There may be people in here that are, 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 are responsible to judge things in the earth. You know, I mean, a, a policeman's got to make a judgment call when he pulls you over. A, a judge has to judge you. Basically, all all good judgment is based on motive and intent. I mean, if you as a mom or a dad, don't you want to? Uh, we always try to figure out: is this childish foolishness, or is this willful disobedience? As a parent, you got to be a judge all the time. Now, my mom wasn't just a judge only; she was a judge, jury, and executioner. Bam! She hit you, and then she asked questions later. I, it took me years to realize that God loves me. <laughs> I went to Catholic school, folks. I mean, listen, nothing against Catholicism, but when I grew up as a kid in the, in the 60s in, in school, I got the daylights beat out of me. They can't do that today. But that happened to me. <laughs> and it was never my fault. 46 detentions in two years. Never my fault. So we have to understand that there are times that, that our motives aren't pure. We do things because our motives aren't pure. We do things to be seen of men. We, we do things like, um, uh, you know, I mean, and they're unscrupulous teachers in the body of Christ. You know, they're un, we're, we're normal. We're, 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 listen, man, they're unscrupulous teachers in the body of Christ. You know what I mean? And, and we've all grown up in such a fashion that, you know, people can put pressure on you. I'm telling you right now, you know, uh, if you give me $5,000, God's going to bless you. Now, okay, if that's a rhema word, I get it. But there are unscrupulous people that put that kind of pressure on people. I've sat right where you're at, and I've heard the same thing. And I'm trying to decide, God, is that you? Because I don't mind giving $5,000 if that's God. It's okay. But we have to give an account as pastors, there's no, there's no separation, clergy and laity. We are all stand before God, and he judges us all equally. So, and teachers come under stricter judgment. So, listen, my head's on the chopping block ten times uh, uh, more than, than maybe the average person, because what's my motive and what's my intent? And why did I lead my people all these years? And what, what was in it for me? Did I do that? Uh, did, I, did I use people? Or did I release people to be used? Those are all things that we've got to, to give an account for. So let me give you some, uh, a little bit of insight. I want to read something to you by Dr. J. Hampton Keithley, uh, who uh, wrote... Uh, quite a, an in-depth article about the, the Bema seat. And, and you know what? I can't do better than to give him the credit and, and read a little couple of paragraphs to you. So the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ, is a tribunal for rewards. This may come as a surprise to people, but it's a, it's a, it's a reward ceremony. 
In the large Olympic arenas, there was an elevated seat on which the judge of the contest sat after the contests were over, much like the Olympics that we see today. The successful competitors would assemble before the bema to receive their rewards or crown. The bema was not a judicial bench where someone was condemned. It was a reward seat. It was a reward seat. So it is today. Likewise, the judgment seat of Christ is not a judicial bench. The Christian life is a race and the divine umpire is Jesus. After the race is over for each believer, God will gather every member before the judgment seat of Christ for the purpose of examining each one and giving the proper rewards to each one. You Listen, it can't get better than this. You and I, before we gave our life to Christ, we were slaves of sin. We were not free men and we were not free women. And Jesus Christ paid the penalty for my sin. He whom the Son set free is free indeed. Do you realize that we were bound by sin and Christ set us free? So today we are free men, free to serve God, and not only do we freely serve Him and freely enjoy Him, but on top of all of that, He rewards us. He rewards us. If I'm free today, and on top of that, I get rewarded. Therefore, the judgment seat of Christ is not designed to punish believers, but rather to reward them for their faithful service. All of us will have to give an account of what we've done after trusting Christ as Savior. Therefore, the judgment seat of Christ is a judgment of believers' works after you come to Christ. After you come to Christ. You see, again, there's a, there's a concept called personality filtration. How we view, how we were raised, and how we perceive God filters into our own personal theology. And we've got to be careful that our personal theology matches what the Word says. My mom would call me to task for everything I ever did and, and stuff that my brother did <laughs> and my sister. I was getting blamed for everything all the time. And, and I love my mom. She's with Jesus right now. But my mom wasn't one to love you unconditionally. If you were good, she loved you. If you were bad, you'd sit at the table. She wouldn't talk to me for two weeks. But my brother and my sister were her best friends. So she tried to control through, by withdrawing affection and emotion. That kind of filtered over in my early days into if I'm good, God loves me. If I'm bad, God punishes me. Can anybody say amen to that? If I'm good, God blesses me. But man, when I screw up, must be I got a flat tire and my battery died and, and uh, my kids got sick because I must have been bad somewhere. That's false teaching. God's for us. He's not against us. We have to understand that the, the Bema seat is not punitive. We know that Christ paid the penalty for the believers pre and post conversion. All of our sins have been forgiven prior uh, to coming to Christ. Currently, and anything that my wife will ever do, God has forgiven her. God has forgiven you. You're forgiven. All our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. So when I stand before God, some of us have this concept that, oh man, here it comes. He's going to embarrass me in front of a hundred million believers from, from, from eternity past and eternity present. Angels, everything, even devils are going to hear stuff that I didn't think they, they we, it's an embarrassment sem, uh, ceremony. The enemy would have us think that the secrets of our heart are going to be disclosed and this is going to be total embarrassment. I'm going to be wearing a dunce hat for eternity. But that's not the case. The Bema seat of God, the judgment seat of Christ, is not to embarrass. It's to reward. 
If you will make your life count every single day, I guarantee you that when you draw your last breath and you stand before God, and when the time comes, when the judgment seat of Christ isn't as important, when it takes place isn't as important as why it takes place. It's going to take place, and theologians differ on when, but the why is completely, uh, uh, everyone is solid on the why. Did your life count? Did your life count? And you know what? You can't even judge that. Only God can judge that. You can look and say, you know, my life is worthless. I haven't done much for Christ. You don't know that. You have no idea. You have no idea the smile you may have given someone, what that might have done to someone. You have no idea the encouraging word you might have given someone, what that might have done to someone. You don't know if you could have, uh, if, if what you did or what you said avoided a catastrophe in somebody's life. You, you think that maybe the, the buck you gave somebody, ah, what's it, it's only a dollar. You don't know what that meant to them. Only God can truly judge. So leave the judgment to God. Let's keep going here. The examination may bring with it a loss of reward. Now, we do know that. 1 Corinthians 3.15 says, If someone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as through fire. We know that everything we do is going to be presented to the Lord, and, and the fire of God is going to um, examine what we've done, examine our motives, examine why we did what we did, and... The fire of God is oftentimes associated with the holiness of God. And so through that filter, what remains is going to be gold and silver and precious. And what didn't remain is going to be burned up. Let's say, for instance, I'm like, uh, you know, okay, uh, I just want you all to know that uh, I gave $100 to somebody uh, in the lobby. And uh, bless God, I just want you to know that. Well, I didn't. Let's just say I did. Now, you saw me shaking Raphael's hand, but there was nothing in my hand when I shook his hand. And there's nothing in yours either. But, uh, uh, but just say that what I did, I did because I wanted to be seen by men. I wanted you to say, look at that guy. What a good guy he is. You know, Jesus said, okay, when you do stuff like that, You've, you've got a reward. You already got your reward. What men thought of you, that's your reward. But when you get to heaven and you stand before the beam of seat, there's no reward because your motive was to do something to be seen by men. So you got a reward on the earth, but no reward in heaven. But I, it, I don't lose my salvation. I still go to heaven. There's no purgatory. I don't have to work this situation out. I come to heaven. My sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. I'm forgiven. I stand before God forgiven. Matter of fact, it even gets better than that. I don't just stand before him forgiven. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20 uh, sums up as he who knew no sin became sin for me that I might become the righteousness of God in Christ. I stand before God righteous, forgiven. I might be penniless. <laughs> My rewards might get burned up. But that's the, the loss I suffer are the rewards. I lose the reward. But to that point, let's understand this. The Bible suggests that there's going to be some shame at the judgment seat of Christ to a, a greater or lesser degree. In this sense. Think about um, graduation, whether you graduated from uh, elementary school, whether you graduated from high school, whether you graduated from, from college. You got your associate, your bachelor's, or postgraduate work, um, you know, a master's or a doctorate. So imagine that, that this is what it is. Now, you could stand at the awards ceremony and people are, you know, coming up here and they're getting, their, they're getting their degree. They're getting their degree. You could be standing in the audience and thinking, you know, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, you know, 20 people more away from getting my degree. Ah, I wish my grade point average was higher. 
You know, I wish it was higher. You can think about that for a moment, or you can think about, oh my gosh, I'm getting my degree. I got my degree. The, 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 the reward is your degree. And the degree should eclipse, oh, I wish I got a, a, a higher grade point average. No, I got a degree. Few people ask you uh, on, an, on an interview or, or if you're talking to someone, hey, uh, hey, did you go to college? Yeah, I went to college. What did you get? Yeah, I got a, I got a bachelor's in, in theology. Really? What was your GPA? I've never had anybody ask me that. What was your GPA? Right? If they did, I'd say, none of your business. I got a bachelor's. None of your business. Was it an accredited school? How high was your GPA? Were you the valedictorian? Were you the salutatorian? No, I got a degree, and I'm happy. End of discussion. Well, it's kind of like that. Each believer's impelling desire should be to please the Lord. We're going to apparently have time to reflect on this earthly life, and some of us may have some regret. Some of us may have some regret. Uh, but the latter realization of regret is going to be eclipsed by boundless joy. Boundless joy. That is the atmosphere of heaven. Unhindered, unbridled joy. Do you understand that? When we are with Jesus and we see him face to face and we behold the father and we and the holy spirit is unveiled and we're fellowshipping with the saints for eternity it's unhindered unbridled joy peace a sense of well-being that we could never imagine here on the earth and we're not going to walk away from that and sit in our heavenly mansion and say, oh man, you know, I really wish I did more. No, we're here. We're here. We didn't make it to heaven by our good works. We're saved by grace, but we're rewarded by works. That's important to understand. We are saved by grace. Good works can't save you. You can't make your way into heaven by good works. You don't earn your way into heaven. It's a it's the free gift of God. Salvation is a free gift of God, but you're rewarded by the works that you do. Keep that in mind. That's why I want you to make your life count every single day. Make your life count. Make your life count. Joy is going to be the predominant emotion of life with the Lord. And few of us are going to, after we come away from that tribunal, are going to be wringing our hands saying, wish I did more. We're going to be embraced by the love of God. Embraced by the love of God. Embraced by God's love. Can you imagine being hugged by the Lord Jesus and he looks us in the eye and he says, I know you struggled in your earth life thinking that I love you, but enter into the joy of the Lord. Do you believe me now? You're here. Jesus could say, I got you here. You're here. Can I love you anymore? You're here. So in that respect, then the regret fades. And the appreciation and the adoration for what God has done for us eclipses that. But now we're on this side. We're not on that side. So every single thing you do Moving forward from today on, I'm making you aware and accountable that everything you do comes under scrutiny. And what you do is either going to be profitable or not profitable. Profitable or not profitable. I like this sign that was held up uh, uh, it was in the Dallas Theological Seminary office. It said this, salvation is by grace, graduation is by works. It's the same thing. Salvation is by grace. Rewards are by works. Ephesians 2 verse 10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Do you understand that God tailor-made and created 
good works for every single one of us in this room to do, and they're tailor-made by the gifts of God that have been assigned to us, both the 30-plus motivational gifts and the nine spiritual gifts. And you'll never be happier than when you're moving in your gift. Never, ever, ever be happier than when you're moving in your gift. So every single day when you wake up, you make it your aim to please the Lord. God, I just want to please you today. You've given me gifts to use. You've assigned good works for me to do. Uh, I'm just going to help me keep my eyes open uh, and help me be spiritually sensitive to when uh, I walk into that opportunity. Now, you know, the good news is that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. So if you dedicate your day to God, he'll order your footsteps, and somewhere in the course of the day or the week, God's going to give you some good works to do. You might, you might uh, give someone uh, less fortunate a financial blessing. You might feel prompted to give a phone call if you've got an exhortation gift to encourage someone. You might be encouraged. You know what? On the way home, I think I want to stop uh, uh, over to the nursing home and I, I want to pray for someone. You might be encouraged to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. In the course of your day, you're going to find yourself flowing in good works. Now, what's going to stop you from doing that? And what's going to contribute to you losing that kind of a reward? I'll tell you what. Selfishness. Selfishness. The scripture says that it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. The more I in your life, the less reward you get. The less I in your life, the more reward you get at the end of your life. Because it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And Christ lives in me to be a blessing to people. Now, there are times, you know, that we, God wants us to live a balanced life. There are times when he came away uh, and he got to a lonely place. But for the most part, we want to live our life in such a way to be a blessing to many. We don't want to be selfish with our lives. My time, my money, my house, my car. My possessions, my, 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 me, me, me. I've heard people say, well, why should I help him? What has he ever done for me? (laughs) Loss, reward, taken. God will put us in a situation time and time again. The discipline of the Lord is not punishment. It's really not. The discipline of the Lord is not punishment. Oftentimes, there's something he wants to work out in us. And so he'll place us in that situation time and time again. It's like, why why are these people always asking me for money? Because you're stingy and you don't give anybody anything. Start giving them stuff. It's like, hey, nobody asked me for money anymore. You passed the test. You passed the test. Listen, I, I, I got out of high school. You know, with 40, 60 tensions in two years. It wasn't easy, but I made it out of high school. I got into college. Most of that stuff wasn't my fault. But I, once, I, once I went to college, I didn't have to repeat high school courses anymore. Never took a high school course again because I passed. I passed it. There's a lot of things that I don't struggle with anymore because by the grace of God, I passed that. I passed it. Now there are other challenges ahead that I face that it's obvious that, you know, I need to pass that test. And so every day I view life as, through the lens of, is this pleasing to the Lord? Is what I'm doing pleasing to the Lord? Now let me just say this in such a way that this will glorify God. My mother-in-law lives with me. I love my mother-in-law. Jeannie, if you're listening to this, you know I love you. Now, she's lived with us for 14 years. 10 months, 30 days, 57 minutes. 58 now. I love my mother-in-law. We live in a small home. I mean, that's challenging, you know. Lynn and I have never been empty nesters. You know, we, we thought about selling our house and buying an RV. Then your kids will never be able to move back because they won't know where you are. And uh, 
and or your mother-in-law. But, um, but, but I love my mother-in-law. And you know what? She's in our life for a reason. And so whatever I do, I do it as under the Lord. She's legally blind. She can't hear. Lynn's losing her mind because she doesn't know if, if Jean is saying mom or Tom. Mom or Tom, you know, who are you calling, Tom or mom? But, uh, um, and so that requires more time and more help. Lynn's always bringing her mom to the doctor, and, and, uh, and her life has changed in many respects. Um, but God knows that, and that, that situation, I tell my mother-in-law all the time, you're my insurance policy. She goes, really, how's that? I says, because, you know, you reap what you sow, Jeannie. You reap what you sow. If, if we care for you as we would care for Christ, then we reap what we sow. I said to my son, I'm, I'm 11 years older than Lynn, so I said, listen, Joshua, if anything happens to me, step up to the plate. I want you to take care of your mom. He says, oh, Dad, you don't have to worry about a thing. I'll put her in the best nursing home money can buy. <laughs> I said, oh, Lenny, we got to take care of your mom. We got to ramp it up here. It's not looking good. My point is simply this. Whatever, you know, hey, mom, here's, here's coffee. She uses a walker, and it, and it takes, and I mean forever to get from point A to Z. So I tell her, hey, slow it down. You know, she's, go, she's going like that. And, uh, and, or I'll sit over here with my phone and I'll, and I'll turn the light on real quick and it'll blind her and I'll go, that's the radar, Jeannie, you got to slow it down. Because <laughs> she's going like that. But it's like, here, Jean, here's a cup of coffee. Do you, do you realize the Bible says if you give a prophet uh, a glass of water, you get a prophet's reward? Do you, do you realize how replete the scriptures are with rewards? It's mind-blowing. Let, let me just read you a couple of examples here. Uh, uh, of, of rewards in the Bible. Uh, Matthew 10, 40. Uh, you'll receive a prophet's reward if, if you give him a, a, a glass of water. Uh, Luke 6, 35. But love that is unselfish, seek the best or higher good for your enemies and do good to them and lend, expecting nothing in reward for your reward will be great. If you even give to your enemies, you get a reward. That's crazy. The Bible talks about, uh, you know, what's, uh, God's not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. You get a reward for that. The Bible talks about even uh, little children. Uh, look at this one, Proverbs 19, 17. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and God will reward them. You want to make some good investments? Give. To, instead of cursing your enemy, bless them. If there's an opportunity to give to poor people, to give to the poor maybe rescue missions or, or whatever, or help people that you know that are struggling, bless them. When you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord and the Lord repays. There's blessings like crazy. When you tithe, God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. What about when people gave to Paul the Apostle? He said, because of what you've done, my God is able to supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But you did something, and so you got a reward. People want a reward for something they never did. You get a reward for what you've done. Do you understand that God wants to reward us? And I don't just serve God to get a reward. I serve God because I love him, and I appreciate him, and I'm so grateful. And God... I don't need more. I've got uh, it's the gift of eternal life. When I draw my last breath, I live forever with Christ. And you have pain in your body right now? No more pain. Are any of you struggling? No more struggles. Are any of you discouraged? No more depression. Uh, does the situation look hopeless? No more hopelessness. But on top of that, we get rewarded. I can't even begin to tell you how difficult this is to teach a six-week course in 35 minutes. <laughs> Pastor Jay could say, okay, well, we'll pick this up next week. I can't. So I want to challenge you right now. I want to challenge you right now. We've got to do everything right now while we're alive on the earth to mitigate or to lessen remorse or regret. 
you and I need to live life in such a way to minimize regret. I'm aware that, that I could get called up to heaven in a moment's notice. In a moment's notice. And so I live with my wife. The, the Bible says, husbands, dwell with your wife with understanding. I want to live with Lynn in such a way that if I don't see her again and God instantly takes me, that I've said everything I need to say. I tell her I love her constantly. I treat her like I love her constantly, well, most of the time. I'm, I am Italian. But I want to minimize regret. We've been married 30 years. God, I want to make it to 50, should the Lord uh, give me 20 more years. Every day I try to minimize regret. Every single day. I want to live life in such a fashion that I have few regrets at the end of my life. So I want to encourage you to do this right now. If you bow your head, please. And let's just have a holy and a solemn moment here. 1 John 4, 17 says this. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in the world. So from today forward, if you will, right now, you can build an altar in your seat. You can come to the altar. You can do whatever you want. But I want you to get back into the race. Get back into the race. I want you to forget what lies behind and press forward to what's up ahead. I want you from today forward, moving on, make your life count. Moving forward, make your life count. Moving forward, like Paul, make it your ambition to please the Lord in every way. Today, moving forward, I want you to scrutinize your actions and your words and your motives. And I believe that we can turn this around, you know? I believe that whatever amount of time God gives you and me, he's going to grade the test, throw out our worst marks, curve the test, and God's going to be gracious and say, you know what? That Sunday, when you heard that message, your life changed. You started to do things in such a fashion. I'm going to forget the last 20 years of your life because I saw that you repented. You had a change of heart and you started to move forward differently. God will do that. He did that for Paul the Apostle. Paul's life changed after he met Christ. He said, I worked harder than all the other apostles by the grace that God supplied me with. So today, moving forward, if you will, just ask God, God, help me to change. I don't want to be proud. I don't want to be selfish. I don't want to have a view that this is my money, my time. I don't want to think that my reasonable act of worship is to go to church and I, and I met my obligation and I can live like the devil the rest of the week. God, I want to live every single day pleasing to you, knowing that I've got to give an account. And Lord, you're the just judge. Whatever rewards I get, I thank you for. And whatever worthless things I did, that were unprofitable, I deserve it. But I want to thank you for the free gift of eternal life. And anything you give me on top of that, I won't even begin to thank you enough for all eternity. Would you do that? Would you pray that way, please? And one last thing. If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, you can't have heaven and there are no rewards for you. 
The only thing for you is eternal torment. But that can change right now. If you'll ask Christ to forgive you of your sins and invite him into your life, he will forgive you of your sins right now. Not only that, he will remove your sins as far as east is from west and no longer remember your sins any longer. Christ will give you the free gift of eternal life and you will join your loved ones and your Lord for all eternity. Ask Christ right now, forgive me of my sins, Lord. Come into my life. I may not understand it fully, but thank you for your death on the cross. I know it was for me. And I received that sacrifice that you made for me. Jesus, I make you my Lord and my Savior. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it sincerely, please see Raphael afterwards or tell someone that you believed in your heart and you're telling someone with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord. Thank you so much uh, for your rapt attention and for listening. Uh, I, I want you to know that this message was more for me than you. It's a reminder uh, to me to make my life count every day, and I hope it'll be a reminder to you as well. So God bless you, and thank you for having me.